Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. I want to thank uh, Pastor Tim and the church for inviting Dottie and I here to uh, share our story and to meet you and to greet you. Uh, great to be among the family of God and to have an opportunity to uh, share uh, our story with you. And <clears throat> it's powerful, I think, uh, Every one of you here has got a uh, testimony of what God's done in your life or will do. And so it's important, uh, I think, to be able to share that and encourage you. And so uh, we want to do that this morning. Thank you for coming and uh, hearing my story, the story of power of God to change a life. And uh, <clears throat> it's been... Uh, a great walk I've, we've been on since 1978. I was 42 years old, almost 43 when I came to Jesus. I've been in church all my life, but to me it was uh, Sunday morning. God got an hour of my life, and the rest of the week I was in charge. And you can imagine on the outside it looked like it was working out pretty good. Uh, but on the uh, inside, there was a lot of problems. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, in the uh, 1962, I was an Air Force officer, uh, been assigned to MIT to get a master's degree. And uh, <clears throat> so I was studying hard. That was a hard, hard time. I've been out of school five years and uh, going back in calculus and astronautical engineering and control system theory, all of those things were just, whew, got me drowning. I was in, on probation and uh, the Air Force said, you gotta keep a B average. Well, I didn't even have close to a B average, I'll tell you, it was down in the pits. But they're having mercy on me. They had mercy, mercy, please. And so they let me stay. Met Dottie after that first year, we got married. After the first year, I met her actually just a few months after we got to, I got to Boston. And so we got married and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I met some astronauts while I was working at MIT on the Apollo Guidance and Navigation System, which they had the contract to build. And uh, so these astronauts came up to uh, look at what the system was doing and how to operate it. And so I got to meet them, and they were really on charge, fired up about being astronauts. And I said, well, how did I get that job? <laughs> and they said, well, you got to go to test pilot school when you get out of here. If you go to test pilot school, you might have a chance. So I applied for test pilot school and got accepted. So in uh, June of 1964, we moved to Edwards Air Force Base on the Mojave Desert, about 150 miles or so from... Uh, Los Angeles and uh, started our training. And uh, I was died and gone to heaven. Fighter pilot, man, look at all these airplanes that I'm gonna get to fly. Well, it's in a Mojave Desert, so the weather's good, but it's grim living. And uh, first Air Force Base Dottie would ever seen was Edwards Air Force Base. And, so it wasn't to her liking, but I was having a good time. And uh, anyway, after I graduated the next year, July 65, two months later, I saw an ad in the uh, Los Angeles Times says, NASA's looking for more, ast more astronauts, please apply. So I applied and uh, got selected in April of 1966. Uh, 19 of us showed up at Houston for our the fifth group of astronauts. And uh, it was a tough time back in those days. Uh, Apollo was going full blower, but uh, we had a series of accidents. We had four astronauts, it was 54 of us, I believe. When, and we'd had uh, four guys get killed in airplane accidents. Then we had three astronauts get killed in a fire at Apollo 1, January 67. One guy died in an automobile accident. Three or four were grounded for medical reasons. John Glenn 
Scott Carpenter and others, they, they left. So now there's about 42 of us or so ready for flight. And uh, then we have this fire and that delayed us 18 months. And uh, so things were really roaring. And we had, I guess in October 1967, we, no, 68, we flew our first flight, Apollo 7, with people on board. Two months later, we flew Apollo 8. It's the first time anybody had gone to the moon. It was the riskiest flight NASA ever undertook, in my opinion. They lurched Earth orbit, and buddy, it had to work or they're dead. I mean, every system had to work. There was no backup. And so uh, they said, we'll go. And Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders, our neighbor, uh, went. And so uh, it was successful. Christmas Eve, 1968, they had a television from the moon. The crew starts reading Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very moving moment at that time. Well, of nine, we had nine missions to the moon and uh, six landings. Apollo 7, 13 was supposed to land, but they, they had a problem. So they didn't get to land. But we had six landings. I was on Apollo 16. I had the privilege of working on five of the nine missions to the moon. In mission control for two, Apollo 10, Apollo 11, talking to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin when they landed on the moon. Tension was through the roof, as you can imagine. We were running out of gas. I called Houston, I mean, I called Eagle 30 seconds. They had 30 seconds to land. Then I called, uh, uh, then so about 13 seconds later, Buzz Aldrin said, contact, engine stop. And, uh, they were on the ground. Calm voice, a couple of seconds later, Neil Armstrong. Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Well, I'm so excited, I couldn't even say tranquility. It came out twanquility. <laughs> I corrected myself and finished up. Roger, tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. And the tension just evaporated, big cheers. And we were, we'd made that landing. Neil Armstrong, a few hours later, said one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I started out as backup crew on Apollo 13. Then I went to a prime crew, flew on Apollo 16. And backup crew on Apollo 17. It was the last Apollo flight, December of 1972. It was a dead-end job back up, but we'd had so much fun on Apollo 16. Well, let's take that job, John. Maybe they'll break a leg. <laughs> we'll get to go again. <laughs> and so they didn't. They went and we supported them. So it was a, uh, the end of Apollo. And uh, I want to show you a little bit of Apollo 16. There's uh, lots of stuff on the web today about Apollo and uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a YouTube video called Apollo 16 Remastered or something like that. Anyway, go and uh, look, search you on YouTube for Apollo 16. Two and a half hours. Well, this little video I'm going to show you is 14 minutes. So I sort of crammed in from liftoff to splashdown. So let's start the, nor let's start the video. And uh, <clears throat> So uh, this is silent, so I'll narrate it. Uh, <clears throat> it starts at liftoff, of course. Uh, the Saturn rocket was, is 363 feet tall, 33 feet in diameter, and weighed six and a half million pounds at liftoff. Uh, and the engines were pushing with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And our only experience in the spacecraft was not any noise, but the vibration from side to side. 
you're 360 feet away from the engines. We lift off very slowly and all the white stuff you see falling off is ice. The fuel was very cold, so the atmosphere froze. We had several tons of ice on side, but it only took a couple of seconds to shake off. And we were on our way. Uh, the center section, the center black line is the top of the first stage. And for us, it lasted for two minutes and 41 seconds. It accelerated us to four and a half times gravity. It took us to about 35 miles. And the whole first stage was shaking like crazy. I didn't remember anybody telling me it was supposed to shake that much. <laughs> so I was a little nervous, but John Young said, we're go, we're go, Houston. And uh, Houston said, you're go. I found out later my heartbeat was 140 <laughs> per minute at this point. And I said, what was John's? Oh, his was 70. So <laughs> you can see the cool one. Well, it, four and a half G's, they shut the engine down, engines down, and it was like a train wreck. You went from four and a half G's to zero, just like that, but you're strapped in real tight. And we, but we stiff armed the instrument panel. Uh, and the first, there, the staging, it, you can imagine the explosion it took to separate a 30 foot diameter uh, 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 piece of aluminum. So it's falling away. We didn't see this, of course, from the cockpit, but the camera's in the, uh, in the second stage. It falls away, and uh, then the uh, interstage comes on in the, away, and the engines are blasting. The, you see the uh, Atlantic Ocean, and uh, back on the horizons, uh, that sort of light brown stuff is Florida. And uh, so it, we got in the orbit, Hour and a half later, we were on our way uh, to the moon. And this is a picture I took of the Earth from 20,000 miles away. And you could see the whole circle of the Earth, the brown and the blue and the white of the clouds against the blackness of space. It's always daylight out in space. You never see, never have any night. It's all, the sun's always shining, Earth to moon. Our little spacecraft had about 300 cubic feet of volume. We had three guys in there. Here's Mattingly doing some exercises and uh, against the instrument panel on his right. Here I am uh, spinning a spoon around, just demonstrating zero gravity. Nothing stays still. You cannot get absolutely still. You're just moving and things are going around. And if you don't anchor them, Velcro them down, you end up losing them in the spacecraft. Uh, Manually lost his wedding rings, long story, but, I, uh, but uh, we found it later on. We, our food was mostly dehydrated. Now this is not us, but I wanted to demonstrate what liquid does in space. It takes the shape of a sphere. And so that's grape juice. And uh, Pinky Nelson has a little gobble. And then we have a flying banana. <laughs> And uh, we didn't have any bananas on Apollo. Most of our food was dehydrated. It took three days to get to the moon, and uh, we orbited the moon for one day. And then John and I got in the lunar module, and now we're all powered up, and we're backing away, and Mattingly took our, this photograph. You'll see a white circle appear at the bottom. There it is. Well, right above that's the hatch. Uh, and... Uh, we're heads down now, and from the hatch to the porch, down the ladder's about 15 feet. The lunar module weighed 39,000 pounds at this point. And uh, we're powered up, ready to go. And, <clears throat> and about one hour before we were to land on the backside of the moon, Mattingly reports a problem in the command module, which causes our ha heart to sink because he has problem with the main engine. and that problem was going to re result in an abort and we weren't going to get to land. You can imagine how disappointed we were. But it took six hours, but we're, now we're on the way down and at 7,000 feet we pitch over and we see the landing site. We recognize those two big craters, the black ones, and uh, we're coming in to land and as you get close, you, the engine starts blowing out moon dust. It's very, very fine like powder, so it's like landing through the fog. 
the, the li straight lines below the landing gear are electrical probes. And when they s hit, hit, the in uh, hit the moon, little blue light comes on and says, contact. You shut the engine down and you drop in the last five feet. You don't want to land with the engine running and on a big rock and you plug up the engine, it blows up. So you smartly shut down. Uh, and fortunately, we weren't close to a rock. Notice how dark it is in the shadow, but how bright it is in the sunlight. The sun was about 13 degrees above the horizon. And from sunrise to sunset on the moon's two weeks. We're on the moon for three days, and it was still morning of the moon day when we left. Our cameras had film. They didn't have, we didn't have digital cameras back then. And so we had to load these film magazines, which I'm doing now, on the back of the camera. Uh, and uh, we changed them out uh, every once in a while. And we had color film and black and white. Uh, we put up the flag and we had a car called the Lunar Rover, which we deployed and set up a TV camera and turned it on. And this camera is controlled by an engineer in Mission Control in Houston. So I put up the flag and I'm the guy on the right and John comes out for a, a salute. And I said, John, give me a big Navy salute. So he gives me a big Navy salute. He jumps up about a foot and a half, give me a salute. Now, the flag is held in out is, is not because there's a strong wind up there. There's no atmosphere. Let me go on to this. This is my most embarrassing moment. Uh, I'm the guy just disappeared to the right. The camera pans away, and I'm jogging out with this $10 million worth of moon experiments on this barbell. And, uh, and so as I'm walking out, they fall off. <laughs> Golly, I've fouled up the whole deal. And I look and make sure, the, and I was hoping the camera didn't see this, but they were pointing right at me. So I had to fess up. And I said, this fell off. But fortunately, in one six gravity, they weren't injured. Here's John with a magnetometer experiment. Notice as he's running high, you kick up the dust. And since there's no atmosphere, the dust doesn't swirl around. It just flies out and lands. The dust was about, uh, we never sank in more than a couple of inches. But in some places, it was, I drilled 10 feet into the moon like this, and we jacked it back out, and it was still dust 10 feet down there. And uh, unfortunately, John got hooked up in one of the cables and pulled off an electrical uh, cable, and we lost that experiment. Here's the, what we call the Grand Prix. I'm standing with a movie camera taking his picture as he drives his car around. Notice it's really rough up there. No roads, but no traffic either. So uh, uh, we uh, bounced across the moon. 17 miles we drove. Maximum speed was off scale high and off scale high was over 11 miles an hour. Here I fell down uh, uh, again. And, uh, and so I got to get up. John was busy. So I, I gave a big push. And then I bounce back, another push, almost, and, uh, and one more and I'm up. You can, you can see how the suits are turning gray because of the dust. You could not brush the dust off. And, uh, but inside we were comfortable and all. We usually worked together because it was easier to uh, collect samples, but, uh, in one case, uh, several cases, I decided to do it myself. John was busy on another activity. Uh, during our time there, we collected 213 pounds of moon rocks. Here I am trying to do one by myself. <laughs> Didn't work very well, <clears throat> but I'm determined. Something about that rock was uh, not going to escape me. So I, this time I pitched it up really easily and uh, it got up and I caught it, but I dropped the bag I was putting it in. So, <laughs> so we had a lot of little things like that, uh, and, uh, but we were successful in our experiments. We had big rocks. One rock was uh, 45 feet long and uh, no, 90 feet long and about 40 feet wide, a uh, high. And that was what we called house rock. 
we left the car up there to uh, parked up there to keep our uh, uh, to watch us when we got. This is my scariest moment here, and I'm the guy on the left, and we're doing the Moon Olympics and going to set the high jump record, and I fall over backwards. <clears throat> and if that backpack breaks, I'm dead. That's my life support system. So I rolled right and broke my fall and was on my uh, back. John comes over and says, that wasn't very smart, Charlie. <clears throat> and he helps me up. And uh, I'm okay. My heart is pounding, though, I'll tell you. And uh, then I look up, and there's the TV camera pointed right at me. And Mission Control had seen this stupid stunt. And uh, no more Moon Olympics, guys. I left a picture of my family up there. We left the car up there, so if you want an $8 million car with a dead battery, I can tell you where to go to get it. <laughs> and uh, so here we go back in the... This is actually Apollo 17. But the guy in the mission control, this time he tilted the camera up perfectly and watched us go out of sight. The camera would elevate to about 30 degrees. Now this is actually us. As I had a camera in the, in the window. You're standing up in the lunar module and you don't have any seats. So you strapped yourself in with some cables to hold you in position. About an hour later, we rendezvoused with a command module at an altitude of about uh, 60 miles. We started home on the uh, eighth day, and on the 11th day, we had reentry. We hit the atmosphere at over 26,000 miles an hour, big fireball around the spacecraft. And we came in, and to control the landing point, the spacecraft would roll back and forth. You used to see it doing here. Now we're... Uh, face down, facing the uh, ocean, but now we're uh, looking at the sky, so we rolled 180 degrees, and we go back and forth like that to hit a spot uh, in the Pacific Ocean about uh, several thousand miles south of Hawaii. Uh, at about 100,000 feet, you're basically coming straight down uh, free fall, and at 23,000 feet in Apollo, the parachutes start out, First, first comes out is what was called a drogue chute to stabilize the spacecraft, make sure that the heat shield is hanging down so when the main chutes come out, they're not going to, on the other end, they're not going to get tangled up in the spacecraft. So at 10,000 feet, the main chutes start their deployment. It takes a couple of thousand feet for the three parachutes to blossom out. And I'm looking out my window and taking this picture and it was, that was a beautiful sight. You can have 11 days of success and the parachutes don't come out, you're dead. So uh, uh, we really like the parachutes. Uh, and so here we are floating in as a Navy helicopter taking this picture. Uh, and, uh, and so we get ready for splashdown. And I'm out of uh, position and when we hit the water, my head went, goes back and it, I didn't go unconscious, but it was a pretty good whack. If you look at the left parachute down there, it stays inflated, inflated and flipped us over upside down. And so that was the uh, uh, successful landing. After a few minutes, we were able to blow up some big balloons and we flipped us back over right side up. The Navy came in, put a big, they call it a flotation collar. It's like a big inner tube around a spacecraft. The guy gets in and knocks on the door and uh, we open the hatch and get out and they take us, they fly us back to the spacecraft. I mean, to the spaceship. Thank you. Great experience. Great, great, great experience, uh, I'll tell you. Well, uh, uh, so uh, uh, let me tell you another quick story. On the way home, we have a spacewalk and we're one day away from the moon and Mattingly goes out into the back of the spacecraft and uh, to retrieve some film canisters and I float out and I hook my feet against the hatch and I'm monitoring his performance. I look over here and there's the earth 180,000 miles away. And I look over this way and there 50,000 miles away is this gigantic moon. And so I get back inside and uh, he brings his film canisters, and now he's out 
10 feet away working on this experiment and his back is toward me. And all of a sudden I see this glint of gold. I look over and there's his wedding ring floating out the door. <clears throat> there's his wedding ring. Seven days this thing's been inside and we couldn't find it. Now there it goes. And we're traveling through space about 4,000 miles an hour, but everything's moving together. There's no air, so everything just sort of moves together. And there's relative velocity, so the it took a minute or so, float, I grabbed for it and I missed it, and the hatch, it went out the hatch, uh, and uh, a minute or so later, it hit him on the back of the head. <laughs> and now round ring and a round helmet. And I said, well, lost in space, but it took a 180 degree bounce and starts back towards the hatch. About a minute later, it floats through the hatch again, I grabbed it. <laughs> so. So it was, uh, uh, it was uh, a great experience. We had a lot of fun. Well, I went on, uh, as I said, I went on backup crew for Apollo 17. I was 36 years old when I went to the moon. I landed on the moon. Apollo was over, I turned 37. And I'd climbed a ladder of success. In my, and I was at the top of my ladder at 37 years old. And the thought hit me. What are you going to do now? That drive it had in my heart that took me to the moon was still there. And I was frustrated. What am I going to do? Shuttle, I was working on space shuttle, but it wasn't the same as Apollo. So what am I going to do? And, I, and things, uh, things got really, really bad at home. Uh, our marriage wasn't solid at that point, even though we were in church uh, every day. We were a religious family. Dottie, my wife, uh, came from a, a, a family of Episcopal uh, clergy. Her uncle was the Bishop of Atlanta, married us in Atlanta, and uh, her grandfather was a Episcopal priest. But Dottie had come to the stage with, uh, by three years later, in 1975, she's on the verge of suicide. She tried everything except Jesus and she couldn't find any peace and our marriage was falling apart I was still focused on I frustrated no peace in my life and I was focused on what am I going to do all I think all of the Apollo astronauts it's at some degree or other had this problem and so I took my eyes off the moon and put them on money maybe money's the answer let's go get rich I left active duty in the military, went into reserves and opened a Coors beer distributorship in San Antonio, Texas. And it was very lucrative, really, really good business. But after a couple of years, Dottie's on the verge of suicide. And uh, well, no, this was before that. So she's on the verge of suicide in 1975 in October. And some people came to our little church in LaPorte, Texas, what called a Faith Alive. And they gave a testimony about the power of God to change a life. And they shared their stories. And every one of them were had filled with joy and peace and the power of God in their lives. And Dottie saw this love and the joy that they all had. And after that weekend was over, she went into our, we went home and she closed the door in our bedroom and started a prayer and her prayer was God I don't know whether you're real or not and Jesus I don't know whether you're the son of God or not but if you're real I give you my life if you're not want to, if you're not real I want to die pray to die well God shows up there is a really a God and uh and she gave her life, she'd already give, given her life to Jesus, and over the next two months, Jesus began to re reveal her, himself to her through answered prayer, and uh, she changed from sadness to joy. She's got a little booklet now uh, that's probably outside at the book table called From Sadness to Joy, and uh, it tells her this little story, this big story of her changing her life. I was there that weekend, but my mind was on the money starting this business. We moved, to, uh, moved from Houston to New Braunfels, Texas, where we still live near San Antonio. 
And then, uh, so I ran this business, and, but it was frustrating. I still had no peace, and Dottie said, well, why don't you pray if uh, God wants you in the beer business? And uh, I said, why don't you pray? And so she prayed, uh, God, if you want Charlie in the beer business, make it, give him peace. If you not, make it so miserable that he sells out. So uh, about six months later, the money was terrific, but uh, no peace. It was worse and worse and worse. So I said, I sell out. So in uh, March of 78, I sold out. And in October, I mean, in the next month, in April of 78, a guy from our church invited us to a Bible study at uh, the tennis club. And we went, kicking and screaming, I did. And uh, from Friday night to Saturday and all day Sunday. And it was the story of Jesus from Genesis to Revelations, the beginning of the end of the Bible. And I can't go into all of the details, but this, let me give you two scriptures that stuck with me that I had learned in, Bab, in Sunday school as a young boy in the Baptist church in South Carolina. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. If you believe in him, you'll not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. The thought occurred to me, you know, that's either the truth or the biggest lie ever perpetrated against humanity. And guess what? You decide. God's offering us gift, eternity. But we decide, is it true or is it a lie? It's one or the other. Either true or not. And you decide. I decide. And so sitting in my automobile that weekend, I looked over at Dottie and I said, there's no doubt in my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I said, Lord, I give you my life. I didn't hear any angels. I didn't see any angels. I didn't, the only thing that happened for the very first time in my life, I experienced the peace of God. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I'd made the right decision. Jesus came into my life. I didn't say the sinner's prayer. I didn't do any of that. I just said, Lord, come into my life. I give you my life. The next day, I had this insatiable desire to read the Bible. So I began to read the scriptures. And the more I read, the more convicted I became of the sin in my life. The Bible says some people's sin goes ahead of them. It's obvious, you're a sinner. Some people just hide their sins, you know, and they comes along behind them. And, uh, but I discovered that the Bible is the Word of God. It is the truth. And it is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and will judge the attitudes of our hearts. And you cannot read the Bible without your heart getting judged if you have sin in your life. And so I get over to Ephesians, and three things I want to discuss with you. And, and, but there's a lot more, but just these three. One in Ephesians, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. God spoke to my heart, you don't love your wife that way. Yes, Lord, I, I realize that, but I want to. Help me, forgive me. And Jesus forgave me. Dottie forgave me, and we began to build our marriage in <clears throat> April 1978 on the solid rock of Jesus. And our marriage began to blossom. There's a di diagram shows you here, you and wife here, Jesus here. The closer you get to Jesus, the closer you get to one another. And over the last now 42 years, almost 43 years. It's been a, a bumpy road. Jesus doesn't promise a bed of roses, but he promises I'll be with you in all your troubles. And he's been there. Not one promise of God has failed us in, in our walk with Jesus. And so he saved our marriage and given us a platform. 
He uses the moon to give, open the doors for me and Dottie to go share not only the moonwalk and adventure of that, but with a greater adventure of the walk with Jesus. And so we've had a lot of pitfalls, but uh, God has pulled us through. Now we're coming up on uh, 58 years of marriage. I think we got it made, folks. <laughs> Hallelujah. So uh, next one came to my kids. I was a military drill instructor dad. You do what I tell you. And uh, they were pretty good kids. They were obedient, but I could, you know, I was on them all the time. You're not right. You're not right. And I was beating them into submission, not physically, but verbally. And I get over to Proverbs, and the Prover in Proverbs, the 18th chapter says, you have the power of life and death in your tongue. Now, that's a powerful statement. God says we can speak life or we can speak death with what comes out of our mouth. And God spoke to my heart and said, you have cursed your own children. I'm not talking about profanity. I'm talking about words like, Tom, you're stupid. I've spoken a curse over my son. And he was becoming exactly what I spoke. Coming up teenager. And so I repented. I mean, in tears, because I love these kids. And I opened, uh, I went to him and I said, boys, forgive me. Forgive me. And they said, that's okay, dad. And we began, I began to bless my kids and encourage my kids changed totally and they began to blossom like spring flowers and they very successful young boys never really rebelled against God they've been followed now they've given us nine grandchildren and I'm blessing the socks <laughs> off of our grandchildren because I see the power of life and death in your tongue Little whisper there, little whisper there at church. Oh, do you hear that or did you hear this? You can destroy one another with what we say. Fathers, be careful what you say. Bless your children. Correct your children. Discipline your children, but with love. As God disciplines us with love, correction. Last thing I want to talk about is money. Made a lot of money. But in this 49th Psalm, God kept speaking to me over and over again. 49th Psalm, do not be impressed when a man grows rich and the spender of his house increases. He will take nothing with him when he dies. It's true. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Be generous. Give. And I will give unto you. I know a lot of men multi multi millionaires and they're the biggest givers got the gen most generous heart you ever know but you might not be you might be a day laborer but God says give and I'll give to you he'll take care of you yeah. so our life is uh, focused on Jesus now and <clears throat> it's a life that's changed us and changed our family and changed our outlook on life. We pray and we seek God's direction. In our ministry, we've been all over the world. We've seen the power of God to change lives, miracles of healing, of deliverance. As I was praying today, God, this morning before, the, the early this morning, God said there was gonna be a red-headed lady in this congregation and it is needs prayer so I don't know where you are or what your problem is but God hears you and he's going to touch your life and God speaks to our hearts and we need to operate and just move in those kind of ways as God moves through us and we allow him 
to minister through us. And so I praise God for the opportunity to be here today. 19, almost 40, well, almost 49 years ago, I walked on the moon, lasted three days. Cost the U.S. government like $400 million to send me to the moon. Two years of training, and it's over. I never walk on the moon again, but I can walk with Jesus. The walk with Jesus is free, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is the gift of God. You get your gift, eternity with Jesus. Doesn't cost you anything. Just receive this free gift. As an example, I want to give somebody $10. Anybody want $10 from an astronaut? I see a lot of hands up, but nobody coming to get the $10. Uh, he got here first. Okay. That's an example. That's an example. Jesus has a gift for you. Just reach out and receive it. It changed your life. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for changing these lives of these people. Lord, bless these people. Meet their needs, whatever they may be. We just commit ourselves to you, Lord. May we go forth in the power of your spirit, serving you, seeking you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. Love you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Love you, brother. Just stay standing just for a few moments. Uh, I, I, I'm overwhelmed from hearing from a guy that has made a lot of money, and that wasn't it. What more in life can you do than walk on the moon? And if that doesn't satisfy you, you got to be convinced today that only Jesus, that only Jesus can satisfy you. Let's bow our heads here. Father, today, we give you thanks for the peace that passes all understanding. If you're here today and you've never done what Charlie did, you've never asked Jesus into your heart, Maybe right now is the time you want to do that. Maybe this afternoon you want to go into your bedroom like Dottie did and kneel down and ask Jesus into your heart. But here's one thing I can tell you. If walking on the moon won't satisfy you, nothing in this life will. I encourage you, ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus, right now, I ask you to come into my heart. All over this place. Don't leave here in misery and in a lack of peace in your life. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that your spirit and only your spirit can bring. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.